I've uh, spent the better part of 20 years studying flying animals, mostly birds, and the air spaces they occupy. Uh, so I'm an ecologist of the air, an aeroecologist, if you will. And I'd like to talk with you about habitat and the way we think about and perceive habitat. Now, habitat is one of our most important and fundamental concepts in ecology. How we interpret habitat influences not only the science of ecology, it influences environmental policy, species management and conservation, and not least the law. So when we change our understanding of habitat, the consequences can be far-reaching. For this reason, uh, my goal in part is to illustrate to you how the airspace is every bit of habitat as a forest or a stream, and that it's in our self-interest to care about and perhaps even preserve airspaces, much like we might preserve a forest or a stream, as a means of protecting our, our natural heritage. So, if you search Google Images for the word sky, uh, you see something like this. Uh, where the sky is actually used as backdrop, you know, it's a background, it's a backdrop used to highlight other things like clouds and trees. We even speak this way, not a cloud in the sky, the sun is high in the sky. People taking pictures of the sky aren't taking pictures of empty airspace, and why should they? Its features are largely invisible to us. We don't really sense the airspace. We are of the earth. We are evolved as visual creatures that live life on a flat surface that for millions of years has been a reliable source of food and security. To natively perceive the airspace requires perhaps a different set of senses and a brain wired to life in three dimensions. So to us, the airspace can seem like a pretty bleak and empty place, but nothing could be further from the truth. So try to imagine variation in wind speed and temperature, moisture, uh, wind speed and direction, moisture and temperature gradients, changing air densities, odor, polarized light, gravity, magnetic fields, all these things are going on up there. Okay, And while they may not mean much to us in many respects, to animals that spend their lives in the air, they're important. Now, there's a lot of life up there. There are more than a thousand species of bats and ten times that many species of birds and untold numbers of insects. And among all this aerofauna, if you will, um, the common swift and it's a really a, a pretty drab bird, uh, despite this pretty kind of striking and cool image by Noel Camilleri, has some interesting biology. This bird has been documented to remain in flight continuously for up to 10 months at a time without landing. <laughs> so are we to believe that the common swift is spending 80% of its life outside habitat? And if so, what do we call that place that it's in? It turns out that the airspace actually satisfies the most widely cited definitions of habitat, which boil down to two main parts. It's a place animals occupy that provide resources for survival. Now, those resources, polarized light and magnetic fields and winds, they may seem unusual to us, but they are resources nonetheless to flying animals. Okay? Now, we can put small data loggers on, on these swifts, and learn something about their behavior aloft. But the sky, the airspace, is an enormous place. What's happening at larger scales? What's the bigger picture? So it turns out that our system of weather radars, uh, which can detect all flavor of precipitation, uh, these things detect birds and bats and insects just fine. I mean, what is a bird? It's really just a giant raindrop, right? A, a concerted effort is made to scrub or remove all this biology from images like this, so as not to confuse the public. But this is what it looks like when we put the biology back in. Okay? This is what the radars are really seeing. These so-called weather radars may detect more biology than they do weather. Bird migration events like this, not the other one, but this, lay like a blanket over much of North America. Okay? So, I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, taking a closer look at southeast Wisconsin, that image that was just up. And this is a waterfowl migration as seen by a weather radar. But when we look at an image like this, I mean, what does it mean? What are these, what kind of numbers are we talking about here? On this unremarkable day, 
ducks and geese and sandhill cranes initiated flight toward the southeast. And over a time frame of about four hours, 50,000 birds passed within just five kilometers of O'Hare International Airport. So 50,000 birds passed just over that yellow dot in four hours. Now, the reason I bring up O'Hare is to make the point that like deer crossing the road in front of a car, planes are in birds' habitat. Aircraft collisions with birds cause hundreds of millions of dollars in damage uh, annually in the U.S. and perhaps a billion dollars wor worldwide and contribute to some 200 wildlife-related deaths since 1988. Now, for those of you who are already afraid to fly, that's the last thing that you want to hear. <laughs> but flying is perfectly safe, but perhaps it can be made safer and less expensive if we learn more about how aircraft and flying animals share the airspace. Images like data like this can actually be used to uh, uh, forecast bird-related hazards to, to aviation, much the way we would forecast a weather-related hazard. Now, all this said, while birds pose some hazard you know, to, to humans, humans pose by far the greater hazard uh, to birds. Many species have evolved to fly about in clutter-free space. Okay? And as we increasingly develop and fragment these airspaces with our structure, much as we have the landscape, we are disrupting aerial habitats. These structures likely contribute to declines that we are observing in some uh, bird and bat populations. Wind turbines are estimated to kill on the order of 350,000 birds a year in the U.S. and Canada. Unfortunately, that number is tiny compared to the impacts of glass. Bird collisions with windows may kill up to a billion birds a year in the U.S. alone. And now that's a big number. Um, but perhaps remarkably, for many species, the lasting impacts of climate change are going to far outweigh any of these other impacts that we've talked about so far. So we're probably going to have to develop the airspace for alternative energy, as we have been doing. But we can do so and should do so, do so in ways that are safe for flying animals. So conservation of some species may actually require uh, that we preserve airspaces much as we have preserved terrestrial and aquatic habitats. Such airspace reserves may focus on traditional areas of, of, of activity like bat roosts and movement corridors for waterfowl and, and geographies that tend to concentrate bird migration. And this is where our understanding of habitat becomes important as a legal concept. Many of our environmental laws, like the Endangered Species Act, or in Europe, the Habitats Directive, rely on the habitat concept. So it is thought-provoking, I think, to consider if we reinterpret habitat to include the airspace, do we empower existing environmental, habitat-based environmental law to include vast new areas that might otherwise not be considered for preservation. Thanks.